So, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I have a, a number of talking points off of, okay. of, of what that, that is there. So I, I think the last part about it being an advanced trainee, I think is a very important piece to add to that. And I think that, um, you know, when I'm thinking about an absolute beginner, okay, there's like super low hanging fruit, like there's newbie gains. So literally anything can work for them. All right. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't want to pull out big guns for them and I just need them to feel things. But there's a million things that I could look at with new people as being important for how to onboard them and get buy-in. <clears throat> and no, I probably don't want to make them so sore that they can't walk. That could be a great way to lose them. But eventually what I need to do is provide them with high raw stimulus magnitude exercises. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's the main thing that they need. When I think about like, hey, if, if, uh, if I change the word hypertrophy to money, okay, uh, I, I would think that my longer exercises are kind of like collecting hundred dollar bills. Okay. And that my short exercises are kind of like collecting more like singles and fives or something like that. I'm going to have to pay more taxes if I'm collecting more money over here, it puts me in a higher tax bracket. There's more expenses that are going to come along with that for sure. But in the beginning, if I'm broke and I have no money, well, then I probably should be looking for more high yield stuff. I just need big results, big bang sorts of things. And like for a, a relative new person, intermediate kind of, of individual, like I'm going to blast them mostly with compound exercises. If I can take those compounds and I can put them into full range of motion, like that's, the, and I can drive big quantitative changes like that's the sauce that I would be trying to mix in for that person to really be able to change them. Like if I take that intermediate person, I'm just doing isolated stuff. What am I isolating? They don't even have any muscle to isolate at this point in time. Like I need to hit them with the bazooka as many times as possible. And they can usually recover from it. You know what I mean? It's like, I give the, I give, here's where I go into my car analogies. Like this is like taking the, the Toyota Camry for the quarter mile, like it can run the quarter mile again and again and again and again and again. Now, if I have somebody that is an absolute specimen, you know, like, hey, if I make this, this monster do a bunch of compounds over and over and over this week, well, hey, guess what? They squat 600 pounds for reps. They bench five wheels for reps. If I have them do big pulling exercises, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds. So it's like this person, if I give them too much raw stimulus magnitude, they're a drag car that I'm making do too many quarter miles. And like their engine just exploded, their doors blew off, their tires are in pieces. I can't do that with that person. I need to manage that stuff and do it less frequently. It's not that different from other spheres of training either. You know, if I talk about track and field and developing sprinters, you know, you look at the percentages that you give young sprinters, oftentimes what you'll see novices will get about 65% high intensity work and about 35% low intensity work. Advanced sprinters will get somewhere around 35% high intensity work and 65% uh, low intensity work. It kind of flips because the real deal dudes that are like potentially going to the Olympics, they're, you have to save them from their superpowers in many ways. And they need more in the way of like, you know, tempo runs and, and general conditioning because they still need training volume. But, you know, every time that they go hard, it's like got the capacity to blow the doors off the vehicle. So, but if I've got like, you know, kind of a, an up and comer real, they can go hard over and over and over and over again. And it's not going to tear their doors off. So I, I just think that like, you know, there's too many people that are way too juvenile in their training career, focusing on pulling out the sculpting tools and it's like there's nothing to sculpt there's there, it's 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 like uh you know it's a, it's a approach that's inappropriate for the population 
And I, I just think like, you got to go along. Like, I don't know. Some, I feel like Dorian Yates gets brought up a lot these days. Like, you know, his approach was ahead of its time. It's very targeted, very, and, and like, you know, uh, if you watch him train, it's like, why is he so jacked? Maybe because he's inclined pressing four wheels like it's a toy, okay? He's so friggin' strong with his big compounds. It's like, the dude's a monster. Like, then when you take that and you get really meticulous with some of the smaller exercises and finding and feeling pieces and, you know, that's when the sculpting can, like, be worthwhile. But, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying I know exactly where this threshold is, but I think a lot of people are jumping that gun these days of like, you know, they're, they're trying to add the, I, I don't know what to, the, the, the shorter position drills or those kinds of activities at, at, in amounts that are inappropriate ratios for their actual, actual current status. I will agree in the last part that I think there's people that suck at writing programs for compounds and isolation or biased or whatever exercise in general. Like I think people get a few pieces and they just don't know how to put everything together, period. Um, but I'm gonna disagree on the majority of that. Okay. And let's let's let me see if I can walk back and remember all the things. So compound exercises, like I don't I don't see like, okay, somebody doesn't have a lot of muscle. Therefore, they should just do compounds like they I don't look at that as like, well, they don't have enough muscle, so they should do biased exercises. I feel like the I feel like the argument that comes at this. Always now you realize I'm not contract. just talking about barbells here, so, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, hack squats, yeah, yeah. machines like that's all. I, I know this yeah. stuff all exists on a, on, a, on a gradient, right? So but from a principal perspective, what tends to happen is if you're making an argument for if I'm saying, hey this exercise here biases the short head of the bicep, mm -hmm. right? Then the argument is, it's like, oh, you can't really, you can't really bias the short head of the bicep. You can't isolate things. Everything always works together or whatever, right? And it's like, all right, well, I disagree. I think we can get a certain de degree of, of bias, right? Whether, you know, how significant that is, it's like, well, hypertrophy in general happens very small and slow. So mm -hmm. when we're looking at the resolution of difference, like clearly what we're seeing in these studies is like, well, if we can like it, it, by it, one of the things about, for bias is we just went through this the other day. So like we can affect which muscle is getting more of a stretch, right? And we know in the research that that seems to actually have a significant impact, mm -hmm. right? So if these exercises can change the muscle lengths, right? And then we can also do things that are changing the recruitment, you know, and how we're loading it. Then to me, it's just like, I think we have sufficient evidence to assume that like there's, you know, it may... Like the argument usually, like uh, you're familiar with Joe Bennett, no, at all or whatever. He he just put this thing out on TikTok or whatever, and you know they're, they're talking about these exercises or whatever. And the argument is like, well, nobody's ever just grown like one head of the bicep like out to here or whatever. He didn't say that. Somebody in the audience did. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that that's that's ridiculous. It's not, you know. So what what I'm getting at is, well, we can bias, but we don't isolate. So that's the other, that's the other thing is, is then when it comes to the other side of the argument of using these exercises for beginners, people are like, Oh, you know, they don't need to isolate. They need to do this. And I'm like, wait, so the exercises are so specific that they're not good for beginners because they're too specific. But then, but then when I'm trying to apply them from a, from a physique perspective, no, these exercises can't be they're, they're not specific enough so that they don't make a difference i don't think that's what i'm saying i'm not saying i'm yeah. saying that's the narrative in in mm -hmm. general right and so i'm just kind of putting out that my view is is that yeah. these bias exercises are not isolation exercises meaning you're still going to get a bunch of other stuff there right and if you're a beginner your threshold is not very high meaning that if you do an exercise for your upper pec that might cross the threshold for your other pec regions but if you're advanced it may not, you may have to do upper pack and lower pack, right? So when I'm looking at applying this stuff, you know, from a, from a beginner perspective, some of these more biased mo motions are actually just easier for people to learn from a motor command standpoint. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they make sense in terms of kind of dealing with somebody's incoming orthopedic or range of motion issues. Sometimes they make sense in terms of me being able to organize a training program because well, I'm trying to train them more frequently. So instead of hitting 
compounds in a similar plane or being limited to two planes. Now, if I'm training them three times a week or whatever, I have more ways to kind of divvy up those exercises so that I can be maybe getting stimulus here, but that fatigue isn't carrying over because the other day I'm training a different, you know, different division or segment of that muscle. I'm only getting the lengthened stress maybe in one portion of that, which then means that I can go to that well for a different division, you know, very soon rather than waiting for, you know, the whole time for that other division to recover. So I see all of these ways that you could use these tools, regardless of where somebody is in their journey. And when it comes to like, okay, does it have to be just a compound? Why? Like, so just say we're doing a chest press, whether it's a dumbbell press or whatever, something that is triceps, chest, shoulders. Okay. If we were to compare that to doing a fly motion and a tricep extension motion, I could, I could, I could program in a way that I could get you know, the same number of sets of flies and tricep extensions in the time that it would take me to get an equal number of sets of presses. Mm -hmm. Do you, can you confidently say that one of those ways would actually produce better results than well, the other? Let's kind of go way back to like just basic sciences stuff with this. Okay. So when I think about like what makes a fiber adapt you know, the answers that I would give on that is it has to be recruited and fatigued. And when I think about, well, what recruits fibers? The answer there is force. The more force I apply in the Henneman size principle, I will grade and eventually get to the point where I recruit all the fibers. But, you know, it's also a matter of like, as I'm doing more reps, I, I will begin to have to recruit more fibers as well. Okay, but essentially, like I, it's not enough to just recruit a fiber. I also have to fatigue the fiber, you know? And if it's recruited and fatigued, now it will have to respond and it will adapt. And the most common thing that we think of with a fiber adapting is going through protein synthesis and adding structural and contractile proteins to this, you know, unit, this sarcomere. So I think to myself, well, okay, you know, I have all these different motor units and fibers and things like that. And they're going to run on this gamut from slow twitch to fast twitch. And the ones with the greatest growth possibility appear to be these fast twitch fibers. And when it comes to fast twitch fibers, they're easy to fatigue, but hard to recruit. And I need to have fairly substantial levels of forces to get to the point where I can actually cause those fibers to be recruited. And once they're recruited, it's going to take a couple of reps and they're probably going to be fatigued. And now they're going to have the possibility of going through a growth response. Okay. So, you know, uh, and on the flip side, I have slow twitch fibers and they have an opposite profile where they're relatively easy to recruit, but they're hard to fatigue. Now, if I were to take a look at some of the older research that examines like, well, how many of the available fibers in the quadriceps do people use when they're squatting? You know, you kind of look at novices and you're gonna see that it's somewhere in like the maybe 75% area. And if I look at an elite power lifter, they're somewhere around like 97% recruitment. And so to me, like the first thing that I kind of need to do is get this person to a stage where they're actually recruiting more of their fast twitch fibers. So I need to use some higher force exercises. And those are typically going to be compound exercises because I can use multiple joints together to contribute to greater forces. You like force in this in this instance which would be being applied to the muscle is not necessarily correlated to how much weight is used in well, the it's, exercise it's, it's, it's load and then horizontal distance from the rotating yeah, second i can use a significantly lower load on a leg extension to get the same amounts of force actually on my quadriceps than i would need to put on a bar on my back 
But I think that swap. when we talk about the kinds of forces that occur, they're oftentimes lower in isolation exercises where I have less joints contributing to the overall motion. I don't think that's true at all. I think it, we we have greater, we can recruit more motor units and produce more force in an isolated manner than we can in a compound manner. The motor that coordination maybe, is simpler. Yeah. Okay. I mean, maybe that's the case. That's not the thought perspective that I'm coming in with. Okay. The thought perspective I'm coming in with is that compounds are going to be your most forceful activities. And they are the logical choice to be able to give people access to recruiting their fast twitch muscle fibers. And if I recruit it, and first of all, it, it's the first thing that I have to do to get a fiber to start to respond is I have to recruit it first. And now if I can start recruiting it consistently and then fatiguing it, it will grow and change. That is the thought process in my head for why compounds are the appropriate choice for newer people, okay? And then when we get to a state where this person has successfully neurologically unlocked most of the available motor units in their major prime mover muscles, now they're, they, they've got the potential to, they're creating um, unbelievable kinds of forces. And at a certain point, they can't recover from the total amount of force and workload that's, you know, I could dump on them if I kept them just doing a ton of compounds, ton of compounds, ton of compounds. But I think it takes a little while to get there. So like in my mind, you know, to, to switch back to sprinting, the thing that makes, if, if you're, if you want to run faster, the way that you run faster is through more volume of specificity, okay? Means you have to run really fast more times. But if you're already, strong and fast and elite, good luck running fast more times. There's so many things that can potentially become pitfalls when you try to do that. To me, if I wanted to grow something, an organism just bigger, more tissue, I would try to make you lift bigger, heavier, bigger movements. You know, I just look at it as absolute mechanical work. You know, how far is this organism moving big, heavy things. And if I can make it lift big, heavy things through greater distances, then it will probably grow. And, but again, if you're already really big and really strong, trying to add more to that is almost the equivalent of trying to shove 10 pounds of shit into a five pound bag. You know, it's just like, things are going to start falling apart and it's going to be a real problem, okay? When I have lesser developed people, the absolute sheer magnitude of that stimulus is just not as much. They can handle a ton of these like bigger loads, big, big movement kinds of things to a much greater degree because it's just not the same level of absolute stimulus. I'm gonna try steel man compounds for beginners um, because I don't, I'm not against using compounds for beginners. And I think there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that you can argue that that would be the better choice. I do think your argument on the forces and motor unit recruitment is backwards. Okay. Right. Um, but if I was to steel man using compounds for beginners, it would not be because I can get more actual stimulus per muscle or produce or actually get more force on the local tissue. It would be that I can get less force distributed across more tissue in fewer exercises, right? So that means that, you know, for a beginner, you know, they might have to learn fewer movements but be able to hit more tissue, right? So like from that's like, just from a, like, how many movements do I need to learn as a beginner to start on this path of fitness? Well, if you can get some core motor patterns in, that's a really great place to start. That's a really good foundation to build. So I can take that argument and be like, yeah, 
you might want to choose a squat pattern and a this and a that over a leg extension because you know you're going to hit more tissue like uh, you can you can hit quads and glutes like for a beginner you know squats might be a cab exercise you know in terms of the threshold for them so i look at you know when we look at compound exercises so the the more joints and the more tissues that we have the higher the central motor command demand mm -hmm. the less force i will produce at any individual segment the less motor unit recruitment i will get at any individual segment so if we're looking at if we're looking at this through the lens of like tissue stimulus then the biased exercises and the more single joint exercises are just simply going to win from a localized force production that's a pretty much proven concept at this point in time but in terms of beginner they like getting more total body stimulus at the lack of trying to maximize individual tissue stimulus is a valid argument because what they need to adapt the threshold might be very low so even though they would be getting less tissue stimulus it's adequate for where they're at in their training journey because they don't they don't need to redline their tissue at a local level to experience adaptations mm -hmm. okay. at that right so the there. level of threshold changes so that's one of the reasons that a beginner can go in and they can do an ambiguous exercise and get a very broad stimulus benefit because they don't have a high threshold for all of the synergists coming along there that are working at you know whatever because every exercise still has a limiter whether like we we qualify exercises in terms of what they're biased to. All we're doing is informing on an exercise quality. Every exercise you do, something is the limiter. There is something that is going to be the thing that that is what causes failure in there. Yeah. Now, in some exercises, the limiter compared to the next thing is closer, and sometimes it's very far away or whatnot, depending on on what we're working with and how much tissue and whatnot. But there's all exercises have a bias. It's just whether you're informed about what that bias happens to be or not is, re is really what the, what the difference is, is like from my levels, it's like, hey, if you're going to do an exercise, I would rather you would know what that limiter is going to be, right? Like in any given situation, right? Because that gives you a great, great opportunity to now assess somebody's like technique and their form and how they're doing and, you know, where they're sore and stuff. Because if that limiter isn't where, ex where it's expected, right? You see breakdown in their technique at a different joint or they're you know sore or uncomfortable some other place that can tell you that there's something going on in your setup or your execution or that person's structural strength balance etc that you you could improve upon or you you could work on so if i'm looking at man what exercises do i use for a beginner it kind of depends on how am i going to build this beginner's program and what do i have to work with because if i wanted to use more exercises then i'm not going to use all just very global exercises so the, the more exercises I'm going to use, the more specificity I'm going to add to those exercises so that I can make those exercises complementary rather than redundant, right? And if I'm looking at what they need in terms of, you know, threshold of stimulus, then I can look at things like, okay, you know, maybe for this person coming in, we want to work on the squat, but we don't have to take the squat to failure and bury them there because it's not going to take much to get stimulus out of them. Right. It's going to like, it might be like, just simply like the, you know, a beginner, you like, you might be able to put them through a stretch program and they would get doms from just the stretch. Mm -hmm. So like if you're taking them to full knee flexion, they've never been there before. Like you may, that, that may not be the place to hit the gas pedal, but then I could be like, cool. And then we're going to go to the leg extension and we're going to do some work at the, like the short range. That's where I can put the gas pedal on because also now in the beginner, like their motor, like their motor pattern for squat is shit, right? And what happens when you fatigue to your coordination? It's gonna get worse. It gets worse, right? So I have the opportunity to say, hey, we're gonna go over here when you're fresh, and we're gonna manage your loads and your RPE RIR, so that we're gonna get some stimulus here, but we're also gonna really be improving your coordination and your motor pattern here, right? I'm not gonna have you practice bad reps though right? For the sake of the physiological response, I'm not going to push you to the point where, all right, this is getting kind of shitty and the technique's going to be here and we're going to be really fatigued and really sore. If I could take you somewhere where now I could just give you constraints and just let you work hard in a way that's going to give me a good physiological response, less fatigue. And the motor, the motor demand or the, like the, the coordination demand is now really low 
So even a beginner could get decent output in that exercise. And it's just knee extension. Like, where are you going to go? You don't have other joints to compound, you know, do whatever, right? So as long as somebody's not like turning into the exorcist in the middle of the, the exercise, right? I can be, be sure that like, man, we're probably getting a fairly localized stimulus here. And they're probably actually able to get a good like physiological demand here that otherwise in something else, we might reach a technique breakdown or something like that before we really got to that same physiological stimulus. So I look at all this stuff as tools. I'm not a, you should do bias exercises beginners, or you should only do compound exercises for beginners. I'm a, you should do what makes sense for, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with that person physique wise, you know, whether are, are any of these skills important to them, right? Are we, is this person coming to you to look better, but also needs to have the skill of X, Y, Z, right? Like that I'm trying to improve, right? Like, do they need to own certain positions? Do they need to, you know, be strong or whatever, like, you know, whatever they pick things up at work or they, you know, they have other sports that they do recreationally or professionally, et cetera, like all of those considerations. Um, how many, like how many times a week and how many exercises, like, are they training at a place like this? you know, or are they training at home with, you know, a couple adjustable dumbbells and some bands, you know, et cetera, right? What's their exercise experience coming in? Is this a person where if the first week they're miserably sore, they're, they're, that's the last week that I'm ever going to see them, right? Um, is this a person that isn't going to feel like they got a good session unless they're sore, right? Is this a person that isn't going to feel like they get a good workout unless they have a blazing burn in a pump or so whatever, right? consider There's all, like all, you could use these tools, so that you can accomplish the physiological goal and the skill goal that you want in a way that the person's actually going to enjoy, mm -hmm. right? And want to come back and do again, right? And I, so I don't see any reason to create a rule of like beginners should do compounds and advanced people should do this because I don't see any negative to using either approach if it actually fits, it, like if you program it appropriately but I could make a negative for either approach if you program it inappropriately, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you only get one pull exercise, well, an iliac like pull down is probably like going to one extreme division, like the most extreme outer edge of a lat is probably not ideal. Same thing, I wouldn't go all the way to the other one, just do the highest division of the thoracic. It's like, if you get one pull, I'm probably gonna aim for the middle, right? So that we get as much lat as we can that's still a biased exercise it's biased to the middle but it's going to have but it's going to have the most kind of like radiant effect so it's like okay i can still use that knowledge about the anatomy and apply that in this context it's like well if i only have one exercise which motion would give me the broadest possible stimulus across that tissue that i could have right but mm -hmm. if i'm going to use two exercises i wouldn't pick two like i i'm not going to if i hit the target i'm not you know I'm not going to try and shoot through the same arrow for the second, you know, the second one, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try and hit two bullseyes, right? So, but in different, in different places. So I think just getting a feel for the audience, I feel like in a, we should probably take a little bit of a break soon. Yeah, I was going to do it in three. I, um, I'd love to be able to try to say back to you what I think your big points were to see if I understand mm -hmm. and hopefully maybe to help uh, people that are listening as well. So, you know, I think that we have a difference, like the stated points that we made are different from the perspective of you're saying that I will have the, an ability to recruit and fatigue more motor units in a quad with a more isolated quad exercise. Yeah, leg extension versus squat. Yeah. Okay. And because largely because the internal forces at the quad are going to be higher with that exercise compared to a more compound exercise. It's not so much that it's the, the internal forces are based off of what you could recruit, mm -hmm. right? So the fewer things I have to recruit, the more I can recruit the one thing. Mm -hmm. So in, for the internal, yep. the exercise is irrelevant as much in terms of like, it's not the load of the forces. It's how many the joints focus. and how much tissue do I have to, okay. to manage? And <clears throat> you might be able to make the statement that the more total organism motor units that are recruited in a drill, the less specific motor units are recruited in any local region. 
Yeah. Would that be a fair way to look yeah, at it? The, the more and things are moving, the almost less goes into like, one part. If I thought, like, to me, like, the most global motor unit recruiting task I could possibly think of would probably, probably be running or swimming, okay? Yeah. So because of the large disbursement of motor unit total recruitment from recruiting 100% motor units in the body, I won't be able to put enough stimulus on any specific motor unit in a region to be able to drive it closer to recruitment plus fatigue for adaptive change. That's a, a probably a fair way to look at it. On a per set basis. You yep. can always still yep. accomplish fatigue with volume. I can make an absolute new person hypertrophy by having them run a mile probably. Yeah. Okay. I'm the more that you become advanced, the more that I have to put my focal recruitment and fatigue laser on. It, it, remo it removes choice. Basically, as you become it, like yep. in a beginner, you have tons of options. As yep. you become advanced, you now, now it's like, well, now you no longer have a choice but to do those yep. more specific yep. things. And I think that you're, you're essentially saying that at any point in time, I can choose to become more laser like with my recruitment and fatigue of any part of the body with any population. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, I don't need to have an exclusive thought process of this level of training history gets this approach versus that approach or any other. Okay. And, you know, I, I guess that it's, it's, a perspective you know what i mean and it, it's one that comes with reason and thought and and logic and i i appreciate that and i i guess that i would look at it as we could probably create a spectrum of you know understanding that on one side of this we have total organism motor unit recruitment and the more that we do that the more dispersed it is and the less of any particular motor unit group, we really drive towards peak uh, challenge and adaptive potential. And maybe I could look at it as in the absolute beginning of working with someone, I can do that and probably get fairly holistic growth. And as that holistic growth is diminished with training experience, maybe I have to become more and more detailed and focused on each specific region with exercises that more and more isolate that region. I think that's the general thought process that, that I have and that I like this stuff over here is the low hanging fruit. You know, I could do thrusters and burpees and grow the body on a beginner and thrusters and burpees are a waste of time for someone that's going to try to step on stage for the Olympia. They need to go in with a scalpel and target an area and eliminate all other areas. So that area receives the stimulus necessary for it to grow appropriately. Okay. Like that to me is the framework and kind of a sequential operating system that I would think to go with but that doesn't necessarily change my thought process on the chapter by chapter journey through the story of getting swole. You know, it's, it, it is still to me more compound. And again, like running and swimming and climbing are the most compound things I could possibly think of. And as I go through the chapters, things become just simply less compound over time until I get to the end chapters and things like, you know, isolated or short position things begin to emerge as, you know, highlighted points in those paragraphs and sections. That's at least my viewpoint on, on what occurs with this, that it's a convergence towards more target over time with a bigger swath in the beginning that just simply reduces with time. I think there, what you're describing is what I would consider that is the constraint of what has to happen. 
but I, but what I believe is, is that you could have like integrating the more specific training earlier, if programmed well, doesn't necessarily have a negative, could have a positive mm -hmm. and vice versa. That like you, cause if you're doing going to do two chest exercises, you could do flat barbell pumps one day and flat dumbbell bench the other day. Right. But you probably wouldn't, right. What would you probably do? I probably have some kind of flat and some kind of incline. There you go. So those, but basically you're biasing two different regions by doing an incline and a flat. Right. So are like, I see, I see everybody is applying this stuff, but they're applying it to at their understanding mm -hmm. of, or like their understanding of, well, how much do I need to divide this or how much am I capable of breaking it up? Right. But all of a sudden when you have the tools of like, well, okay, I can actually break this up into more pieces or whatever. Right. Now you can look at it as like, okay, well, now I have, you know, maybe I've shortened and lengthened exercises for upper and I have upper middle and lower pec options. Right. So I could choose to be like, all right, I can do upper and lower instead of, you know, middle and upper thinking that like, well, if I'm hitting these two, then there's going to be some radiant to the middle on both days. Right. And so you could take that logic of approach. Right. Or if you're training somebody three times a week, you could do each of, you know, the three or whatever, or if somebody's like, Hey, I'm a beginner, but I also want to work on this thing. You'd be like, all right, I'm going to train this two times a week. And this one, one time a week, like, so I don't see any negative. I mean, like I said, all exercises have a bias, regardless of how compound they are, they have a limiter. So I'm just saying, knowing the bias, knowing the limiters allows you to make those exercise selections because I mean, even people are just using compound exercises. Are you only using one lower body push? No, no typically not. Right. You're going to, I mean, you're going to use different squat patterns, right? Now you're, you're, like a one person's reasoning for why they might be using different ones might be communicated differently. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's still in almost all of those cases, if it's still likely they're shifting that bias yep. somewhere else, whether it's becoming, Oh, I had a, you know, a more hip, like I had a glute dominant push and then I had a quad dominant push. Right. Or had a single, single leg and a butt like there, these things are happening. Right. It's just how you how informed are you sure. on what actual changes you are making with that selection? And what I'm saying is, is that there is not a limit to how granular you can be with the beginner if, if you program it appropriately for what they need, right? Like I could come up, like, especially here, I got all these machines or whatever. There's no reason I couldn't bring a beginner in and have a, term, a super high number of exercises that I take them through because they they will all be very easy for them to learn and apply right and i understand how to like move the stress around the body so that we could like you know be efficient with our volume and our in our in our frequency right mm -hmm. so really it comes down to like understanding these exercises and applying them correctly i think in general if you reduce yourself to like hey i'm going to do fewer exercises than these what it does is it reduces the amount of decisions that you have to make and chances for error because mm -hmm. if you don't know shit about exercise well, then don't use, you, you, you can't be like, well, I'm going to do this and this and this because you don't know what that combination is, yep. right? You know, it's like trying to cook without knowing what the ingredients taste like, right? So what are you going to do? You're like, well, I, these two things I know. So I'm just going to put those in there and I'm not yep. going to risk throwing these other things in there and then accidentally having onion cookies or whatever, yep. you know, whatever. Yeah, pretty good at be. making grilled cheese. Yeah. Um, if it Would it be fair to say in some ways I could summarize your last point as like, what most professionals do is fairly similar, but how and why they do it that way oftentimes is divergent. And maybe your ability to ascend as a professional is improved by having better, more accurate hows and whys. I would say most professionals are doing this on an amateur level, but they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. They're just, they're just do. I mean, they're, do, they're doing it less informed meaning that in some ways they're doing it on an accident, yep. right? Or they're doing it with a different logic, right? That they're not realizing this is one of the major mechanisms behind 
their decision-making processes, but they learned it through a different scope of maybe it's like, Hey, I'm loading through different planes of motion. Well, if you're changing planes of motion, you're changing the tissue. That's going to be biased in those things or whatever. Right. So it's like, you know, it's either they're looking at, they're doing it through a different lens or they're doing it out of anecdote, knowing that like, look, if I do this exercise, I can't do that other exercise on Thursday. Right. Just because I know when I did that last, like, or I did that to Susan, Susan was screwed. Like, like, you know, so you these the you you will be either forced to learn these things at least to a certain degree Mm -hmm. right um or you or you can get ahead of it by learning learning it academically the heuristic versus the yeah Mm -hmm. 